thank you all for being here tonight, especially tonight. It's pretty miserable outside. Um, fortunately, I spent some time living in England, so I feel like I was prepped for my first visit to the Seattle area. And um, let's just jump right in and start talking about the war on kids. Um, and I want to begin by telling you a little bit about Terrence Graham, whose case and whose story is really central to my book. So in 2003, when Terrence was 16, he and three teens attempted to rob a barbecue restaurant in Jacksonville, Florida. They entered through a back door at closing time. Um, they uh, fled when the manager, the angry manager, con confronted them. And one of Terrence's co-defendants um, had a metal bar that night, and, and he did strike the manager, um, sending him to the emergency room for stitches. Um, and I don't mean to minimize that, but just to say that no one was seriously injured in this event. And Terrence himself um, did not use or um, even wield a weapon during any of this. And nonetheless, Terrence was sentenced uh, to life without parole for his involvement in that attempted armed robbery. And so you hear that and you think like, oh my gosh, you know, how, how does that happen? And maybe one of the saddest parts of his case is not just the sentencing structure that made that possible, but the fact that the Florida judge um, who imposed that sentence before he imposed it, he kind of wondered aloud um, why Terrence would throw his life away um, when he'd been given you know, what the judge said was quite a family structure. In fact, he said, I don't understand why you'd be given such an opportunity to do something with your life and why you'd throw it away. And in fact, nothing could have been farther from the truth, right? So what I came to learn in my research and in getting to know Terrence is that he grew up in abject poverty. He had two crack addicted parents. Um, his mother obtained her crack by allowing others to get high in the home. It's called paying the house lady. So um, there were often adults in the home getting high and they didn't want to hear the sounds of young children. So Terrence and his brothers, from the time they were very young, were often sent out into the streets of Jacksonville um, just to create quiet space in the home. And uh, Terrence endured physical, emotional, and verbal abuse that was documented by social services from the time he was a toddler. He was diagnosed with ADHD in his youth, but he was never medicated. Um, his mother would not allow it. When I met Terrence in 2012, um, I asked him about his ex schooling experience because I was curious in particular about the ADHD and his time in school. And his answer was, it's really hard to be in school when you're hungry. So um, by the time he was in the 10th grade, I mean the 10th grade, he was arrested that year for that armed robbery that I, I mentioned. Um, by that time, he'd attended nine schools because his family was moving so often from one subsidized housing unit to another. And so life was violent and chaotic for Terrence um, his entire childhood, despite what that judge said at his sentencing in 2005. And sadly, Terrence is not alone. Right? As the title suggests, in my opinion, the United States has waged a war on kids and like most wars, this particular war has had the biggest impact on poor, minority, and otherwise vulnerable youth, like Terrence. So this is what the war on kids looks like. Today in the United States, prosecutors routinely transfer kids out of juvenile court into the adult court system, often without judicial oversight. Youth in adult court are subject to mandatory minimums that were drafted with adults in mind. Youth can be housed in adult correctional facilities despite the fact that we know youth in those facilities are at the highest risk for physical and sexual assault. Youth are subject to conditions of confinement that I think most of us would think of as only appropriate for adult offenders and really even the most violent among those adult offenders. So things like mechanical restraints, even solitary confinement. Until 2005, the United States was the only developed nation in the world that executed people for juvenile crimes. And today, we are the only developed nation in the world that sentences our children to die in prison. How did this happen, <laughs> right? That's the question. How is it possible that Terrence and thousands of other individuals across the country Thousands were sentenced to die in prison before they were old enough to get a tattoo, to vote, 
certainly to buy a beer. How is it that that cruel indifference that Terrence experienced as a child, how is that woven into our laws and policies? And maybe most importantly, how do we correct course, right? So those are the central questions of the war on kids. Okay, so the first question, how did this happen? So the war on kids, like mass incarceration itself, is a relatively recent phenomenon. The United States invented the juvenile court at the end of the 19th century in Illinois. Um, and it wasn't perfect by any stretch, it was not perfect, but it was um, prompted by this ethic of paternalism, right? And this shared recognition that children who break the law or who are accused of breaking the law, they're typically in need of social services, right? Rather than punishment, and certainly not the kind of punishment that we would mete out for adults. So that was the basic concept behind the juvenile court model um, that was invented in 1899. And over the course of the 20th century, every other state in this country adopted the idea of a juvenile court, a separate judicial system for kids, as did every developed nation around the globe. But the interesting thing is that while we were exporting that idea to other states and to other countries, we also were abandoning it domestically. And in order to understand how that happened and how it happened in such a short period of time, relatively speaking, I think it helps to think of the war on kids as a subplot to the story of mass incarceration. Um, and I don't know how much folks know about that story, but it, it's certainly in the headlines a lot. Um, today in the United States, there are more than two million adults and children behind bars. Um, in 1970, there were fewer than 200,000. So that's pretty dramatic, right? That means in the last four decades, we've seen the population um, balloon 10 times. And that's just my lifetime. So this is a new phenomenon, the mass incarceration phenomenon. And as I'm sure you know just from reading headlines again, mass incarceration has not affected Americans equally, right? Four out of five criminal defendants are poor. And while those criminal defendants are entitled to a lawyer, a zealous lawyer actually, um, most public defenders are overworked and underpaid, and as a result, those individuals, poor defendants, don't receive on a regular basis, do not receive the kind of zealous representation to which they're entitled under the Sixth Amendment. So that's a poverty issue. There's also a race issue with our system. Um, as Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow and, and others have documented, um, mass incarceration has taken a tremendous toll on minority communities. Minorities in America today are exponentially more likely to be under correctional control. Um, black and Latinos, uh, black and Latino communities in this country comprise less than one third of the general population, more than two thirds of the correctional population. So there's just a huge overrepresentation in the system. Um, and, and uh, you may have seen again, this came up during the presidential debates, that one in three black males born today, based on current incarceration rates, one in three black males born today can expect to spend some time in prison. I mean, that's just shocking, right? That's a, a damning statistic. So, so with, ri uh, with the rise of crime in the 1970s, there was in fact a, a steady increase in crime in this country between the 1970s and the 1990s, peaking in the mid-1990s. And what happened is that politicians across the political spectrum adopted tough on crime policies, right? Felt this political need to be tough on crime. In some ways, um, on the left, even more so, I think more pressure. So again, across the political spectrum, across the nation, lawmakers enacted more criminal laws, right, put more crimes on the books, and also attached stiffer sentences for those crimes. So as we sent more people to prison for longer periods of time, our prison population ballooned. And juveniles suffered from that trend too. There were really two pieces um, of these tough on crime policies that were particularly detrimental to kids. Um, and those were transfer laws and the introduction of what are called mandatory minimums. So let me say a little bit about each of those. So transfer laws. Um, for most of the 20th century, a child who was accused of a crime was dealt with in juvenile court. That juvenile court model I mentioned that was founded in Illinois. 
In rare cases, if a prosecutor thought that um, the, the child had been uh, accused of a crime that just exceeded the punitive limits of the juvenile court, in rare cases, the prosecutor could seek to have that case moved to adult court. Um, but the prosecutor had to ask a judge, right, had to convince a judge that this case was one that really couldn't be handled in juvenile court. And so that process was rare and it was difficult. As part of tough on crime politics, though, of the 1980s and 1990s, lawmakers passed what are called transfer laws that made it increasingly easy and increasingly common for kids to be transferred out of juvenile court into adult court. So every jurisdiction in the country today has at least one provision, um, many have several provisions, that allow a child, just through legislative fiat, that allow a child, it's just a fiction, right, to be prosecuted as an adult. In some jurisdictions, in fact, in 21 jurisdictions, there is no minimum age that a child must be in order to be transferred to adult court. And in many jurisdictions, there are um, what are called once an adult, always an adult provisions, which means if a 15-year-old is charged as an adult in one crime, going forward, he or she will always be charged as an adult. So we just saw in the, in the late 20th century this radical change in the ease with which cases could be charged against kids in adult court. And around the exact same time, that 1980s, 1990s period, states were also moving from what were called indeterminate sentencing schemes to determinate sentencing schemes. And we think of that, we hear about that more in the context of mandatory minimums. So before the 1980s, a judge would usually have had the opportunity to look at a case, to look at both the nature of the offense, the nature of the offender, although I hate that term, <laughs> it's a placeholder, um, and, and, and um, exercise some discretion about what the appropriate sentence would be. But the move away from that toward determinate sentencing schemes meant that the legislature set in advance what sentence attached to a given crime. So we started sentencing based on the offense, not the offender. And so this was the perfect storm for kids, right? It was the perfect storm for kids. It's not even clear, in my research it's obvious to me that it's not even clear that lawmakers were thinking about the interaction of these two things. But what happened is that you had kids ending up in adult court right, with increasing frequency and ease. And once they got there, they were subject to these mandatory minimums that were drafted with adults in mind. So I'll give you an example of what that looks like on the less extreme end of the spectrum. Um, there are certainly life without parole cases that, that were mandatory, and those are the extreme end of the spectrum. But in the book, I talk about the case of Andre Lyle. His case came out of Iowa. And at 17, Andre had a fight with a high school classmate over a $5 bag of marijuana. Andre, um, in his mind, he had paid for this bag of marijuana, he was entitled to it, and he had a fist fight in the schoolyard. Um, and he punched his, his classmate, and he grabbed that $5 bag of marijuana, and he bolted. Well, he was charged with second-degree robbery, he was transferred to adult court, and he was convicted as an adult of second-degree robbery. And the judge, in his case, had no choice but to impose the mandatory minimum that the legislature had set. And that mandatory minimum was 10 years, 10 years prison time, with seven years required before parole eligibility. So there's no way, I mean, I, I, I'm an optimist by nature, there is no way that the legislators who enacted that statute were thinking about a schoolyard fight over a $5 bag of marijuana when they put a 10-year mandatory minimum on that. And yet, that's, that's just an example of how that worked. And had he been in juvenile court, that never would have happened. Or at least the judge would have had some choice. So that's sort of a quick, really quick, <laughs> primer on how we got here, right? How, how did we simultaneously invent the juvenile court and then within 100 years abandon its very premise? So, um, I want to turn now and talk a little bit about Supreme Court decisions in this area. Uh, for the latter half of the 20th century, the Supreme Court didn't do a lot on kids, right? It didn't, it didn't um, 
look at a lot of juvenile sentencing issues or juvenile procedural rights after the mid-1960s. So for those of us interested in this, the last decade or so has been really an interesting time. Um, and I talk about this in the book, hopefully in a way that is accessible to non-lawyers. I want this to be accessible to non-lawyers because we need non-lawyers to understand what's going on and to feel invested in changing this. Um, so I'll, I'll try to do that tonight too and just talk about three cases that are really crucial. So beginning in 2005, in a series of cases that are referred to as the Miller Trilogy, um, the Supreme Court began to rein in the extent to which states could subject kids to the most severe sanctions at law. And those san sanctions are the death penalty and life without parole. So 2005, um, case called Roper versus Simmons, the court looked at the question of whether or not Christopher Simmons could be executed for a homicide he'd committed as a teenager. Um, there was no claim of actual innocence. There was no um, argument regarding incompetence. It was just his age, right? His argument was, I'm a kid. And it was a, a hard case because um, the facts of it were pretty, pretty brutal. Um, and nonetheless, the Supreme Court held that the Eighth Amendment bars the death penalty for juveniles, right? Categorically. Even those who commit homicide. And the court held that juveniles are less culpable and they're more amenable to rehabilitation. And this decision, the Roper versus uh, Simmons decision, is really crucial today, even though it's 12 years old now, because it set the stage for these later decisions um, in the sense that the court relied heavily on neuroscience in, in the Roper decision. And that science, um, are, are, do we have any scientists here tonight? Any, any scientists? No? Yes? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if we have any neuroscientists, but that science tells us what, I bet we have parents here tonight. Do we have any parents here tonight? Yes. Okay. So uh, that science tells us what every parent knows, certainly what I know from um, mothering a nine and a 12-year-old boy. Um, so the frontal lobe of our brain is not fully developed until well into our 20s. And that is the part of our brain that governs things like judgment and long-term decision-making and risk assessment and planning. And so because that part of the brain is underdeveloped until well into the 20s, guess what? <laughs> Kids are impulsive. They don't think about long-term consequences. They're not good at risk assessment. They're more subject to peer pressure than their adult counterparts are. So the linchpin of that Roper Court's decision was kids are different. They're different biologically. They're not just small adults. They are actually different. And we need to treat them differently in the eyes of the law. So that was 2005. Court abolishes death penalty for kids. It's a little scary that it took us until 2005 to do that, but it did. Um, and so five years later, in Graham versus Florida, the court heard Terrence Graham's challenge to that life without parole sentence that I mentioned at the beginning of my, of my remarks. Um, and Terrence uh, had a great attorney, a guy named Brian Gowdy, who argued his case before the Supreme Court. And his claim was, kids like Terrence have, have what we think of as twice diminished culpability, right? Number one, he's a kid, or he was at the time of the crime. And number two, this is not a homicide crime. And so typically, the death penalty and life without parole, because they are the two most severe sanctions we have on the books, those are things that we think of as being reserved for homicide offenses, typically. Or at least there was a point in time when we did. So um, Terrence's argument before the Supreme Court was, given that I'm a juvenile, given that I committed a non-homicide offense, this life without parole sentence, which is, by the way, analogous to a death penalty for a kid, right? If you're serving a life without parole sentence, you're serving a far greater proportion of your life if you enter that sentence as a teen. And the court agreed. And I won't get into the, the um, mechanics of the Eighth Amendment methodology, but suffice it to say that it was a massive break with the court's Eighth Amendment methodology. And, and, it, and it's almost as if the court was really reaching to find a way to to hold that this was cruel and unusual. And so for people like me who were really invested in following this case, this was a huge decision, 
And many people at the time said, this is not a huge decision, and here's why. So I mentioned that Terrence was serving life without parole for a non-homicide offense. If you had to guess, how many people in the country would you think are serving that sentence, a similar sentence? People like Terrence. Well, it was about 130. That's not a lot. When you have two million people behind bars, that's not a lot of people. So at first, there were many, even many academics who thought, this is just a Florida case, because most of those 130 individuals were in Florida. I mean, and just as an aside, Florida is just a disaster on the criminal justice front, right? I mean, it's like an outlier among outliers. And so at the time of Graham versus Florida, people thought, okay, this is just a, a weird case that's mostly about Florida, I mean, 130 kids. They're going to get a parole hearing, they're going to get denied, and they're going to be sent back to, to spend their life in prison. Not only did that not happen, but more importantly, there was a much larger pool of inmates, about 2,500 inmates nationwide, serving life without parole for a homicide offense that they committed as kids. And so the Graham decision really begged this question, okay, well, what about that bigger pool of individuals, right? What about them? Because they also had underdeveloped brains. They also had a diminished culpability. And so only two years later, in Miller versus Alabama, the court took up that question of uh, life without parole and whether it was constitutional even for individuals who commit homicide offenses. And um, that was Evan Miller's case. At 14, 14 years old, Evan Miller killed a neighbor. In fact, he killed his mother's drug dealer with whom Evan had been drinking and smoking marijuana on the night of the homicide. By the age of 14, Evan had been in and out of foster care. Um, his mother was an alcoholic, a drug addict. His stepfather abused him. Um, so he had a pretty horrific history, none of which came to light during his sentencing. Right? He was charged as an adult at 14. Um, and once he was convicted of murder in Alabama, again, back to mandatory minimums, there was no other sentence available under the law other than life without parole. So. Um, in Miller, the court held that states cannot impose mandatory life without parole on juveniles. Juvenile justice advocates were hoping and praying that the court would just flat out ban juvenile life without parole. It did not. But it did say that before a judge or a state, some a sentencing body, could impose life without parole on a juvenile, that it needed to go through a really searching analysis of that child's um, social history, their academic history, their familial and, and health history. Things like, for example, the fact that this kid had been in and out of foster care, that he was abusing substances, that he had been physically abused, right? That it, the courts needed to look at those social context factors. And the court also signaled in Miller, it addressed the fact that it hadn't banned the sentence outright, but it said, we think, given what we know about the juvenile brain, that appropriate cases for juvenile life without parole will be rare. In fact, the court said they would be exceedingly rare. So that was a huge move forward too. And immediately after that decision, the day after that decision, organizations like the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth tried to begin to follow um, the, the, the tentacles of who are these 2,500 individuals, right? Because they only had a certain amount of time to try to get relief from that decision. And then we had this sort of collateral battle going on, and I, um, I won't, again, I won't get too bogged down in it, but there was this question of, well, who gets to benefit from the Miller rule? And in, in the constitutional law arena, we call that a retroactivity issue. So in other words, the question was, does that Miller rule apply to those 2,500 people who were already sentenced, or does it only apply going forward, right? Does it only mean that from here on out, states can't do what they did to Evan Miller? And the states across the country dealing with those 2,500 were split on that issue. And in 2016, the Supreme Court, in a case called Montgomery versus Louisiana, said yes, it is a decision that applies retroactively. And so across the country today, in 2017, um, people like Henry Montgomery from Montgomery versus Louisiana and Evan Miller um, are in the process of getting resentencing hearings, and in some cases, parole hearings. Um, I have a whole chapter in the book devoted to just the implementation of these cases because it's been really thorny. So um, together, these cases, this Miller trilogy, 
They stand for the proposition that kids are different, that they're different in the eyes of the law, and that state sentencing practices must reflect that fact. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about tonight before we just converse is, is the question of where we go from here, right? What, what do we do about all of this? Um, how do we leverage what the Supreme Court has done? And how do we um, put an end to some of these practices just as citizens, never mind as lawyers? Uh, I have a, a chapter in the book that, that sets out a blueprint for how I think we should approach these reform questions. Um, I promise you I won't march through the blueprint. Um, but let me just say a few things. Uh, and the first, the first thing that we need to do in order to pursue juvenile justice reform is, is something that I didn't think we needed to do when I finished the manuscript. Um, and that is uh, aggressively pursue criminal justice reform nationally. Not Forget about kids, just the criminal justice reform issues. And the reason I say that I didn't think I needed to say that a year ago is because the moment, right, the, the summer of... Um, 2016 <laughs> um, was just a totally different time, right? And uh, it's just been remarkable to me that in the early 21st century, politicians across the political spectrum have really come to recognize that our criminal justice system is broken, right? You, you see completely unlikely allies, right? You see... Um, uh, the Charles Koch Foundation partnering with, um, you know, the ACLU. <laughs> These are unlikely bedfellows, but they've come together because there's this recognition, as I said at the outset, that with two million adults and children behind bars, the United States leads the world in its rate of incarceration. Right? We have five percent of the world's population on on this. United States, right? We have 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prisoners. And that's not because we are more criminally inclined than other people. That's just a function of our laws and our policies that we've chosen to impose. And the status quo, forget, as I said, this is not, I'm not even talking about the juveniles in the system. That system itself, the machinery of mass incarceration, has a hugely detrimental effect on kids, even kids who aren't yet in the system as criminal defendants. Right, so for example, almost three million kids in this country today have an incarcerated parent. One in 28 kids. And we know that that's related to future contact with the criminal justice system. Right? That does correlate. We spend $80 billion a year on corrections. And that's money that we're spending to warehouse people, not spending on things like education and social services that we know keep people out of the system. Okay? Race matters, as I said, race matters at literally every juncture in the system. And so, the system is broken, it's broken entirely, and up until about, how many months into this administration are we? <laughs> up until about um, 10 months ago, uh, there, was, there was real recognition about that. And so the first thing that we need to do in order to pursue a way to end the war on kids is to continue to pursue national criminal justice reform. Um, that's a necessary, it's not a sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition to doing that. And I have to say, I don't know about you guys, but I am taking huge comfort in the fact that my state of Virginia, my home state now, I'm originally from Massachusetts, but woo, Virginia. <laughs> Little shout out for Virginia. I know you guys had a big election day here yesterday as well on the progression front. So, that, so that's really, I take comfort in that, but that's something we have to stay on top of. Um, the second thing we need to do, and this is, I guess, more for the legal community, is really make sure that those Supreme Court cases that I talked about are implemented in a meaningful way. And so, you know, the way the Supreme Court works is they handle, you know, a hundred some odd cases per year. They're confined to looking at each case or controversy. And once they've announced a ruling, it takes years, if not decades, for those decisions to trickle down and to be implemented. And whether or not they'll be implemented in a meaningful way, in a way that's consistent with what the court envisioned, is a totally separate question. Right? Think about how um, Brown versus Board of Education was implemented. It was not implemented peacefully. It was not implemented because the lower courts and state legislatures said, oh, 
Separate is not equal, right? It did not happen that way. And so when it comes to these decisions, as you can imagine, there's, there's much to be excited about, right? Um, but it's not all encouraging. So I'll start with the encouraging stuff. <laughs> um, in 2011, the year before the court heard Evan Miller's challenge to his juvenile life without parole sentence, there were only five states in the country that banned juvenile life without parole, that recognized the unfairness of that sentence. And as of this year, so it's only six years later, 19 states plus the District of Columbia have banned juvenile life without parole. So that's pretty good, right? That's pretty good progress. Um, parole reviews are underway in, in states that uh, had significant juvenile life without parole, JLWAP is the term we use for those populations. Um, Massachusetts and California, significant JLWAP populations. Parole proceedings are underway for some of those individuals. So that's, that's encouraging. Now to the less encouraging news. Um, the Graham decision, let's start with Graham. So Graham versus Florida. The court says juveniles cannot be sentenced to life without parole if they're convicted of non-homicide offenses. So Terrence's case, for example, he was sent back to the Florida courts and the, those courts were to then resentence him to a more appropriate sentence. So you might think, huh, okay, well he can't get life without parole for that attempted armed robbery. Um, what is an appropriate sentence? He received a 25 year sentence. So if he survives, he'll be 39, almost 39 when he's released from prison for that attempted armed robbery of that barbecue restaurant at 16. That in my opinion is a travesty, but sadly he's one of the lucky individuals. You know, I mentioned there were about 130 some odd individuals in his sort of similarly situated pool. Some of the individuals whose cases were revisited by lower courts received 45 years, 65 years. How about 89 years? A federal court recently upheld an 89 year sentence and said it's not the same thing as life without parole for a non-homicide offense because they were consecutive sentences that added up to 89 years as opposed to a flat life without parole sentence. So there will be, there is now and there will be for quite some time, litigation around what is a de facto life sentence, right? And can, how, how far can a court push it in terms of imposing a sentence that is, in my opinion, certainly the equivalent of life. So there's another question of implementation that comes from Graham. The Graham court said in juveniles may in fact, someone like Terrence may in fact end up needing to serve his entire life in prison, but the state cannot make that decision on the day it sentences that person. Right? They need to do some kind of periodic assessment. And actually what the court said is they need to provide a meaningful opportunity to obtain release. And again, the court doesn't say what that means. It says, you need to give them a meaningful opportunity to obtain release. And it's up to the states to determine what that means. So for example, <clears throat> is geriatric release a meaningful opportunity for a juvenile to obtain release? I would say no. I would say that's an end run around what the court asked the states to do. Um, one state has tried to argue that. How about a parole process that is all but defunct? Right? Part of the tough on crime policies of the 80s were abolition of parole. Right? They included abolition of parole in many jurisdictions. And if not um, uh, legal abolition of it, uh, de facto. Right? It's largely gone and or when the parole board meets, no one gets paroled. Right? And there's no explanation of why, there's no basis upon which to appeal, there's no right of appeal, there's no transparency. So again, is that a meaningful opportunity to obtain release? I would argue no. These are open questions and, and literally the answers to these questions will determine whether people will die in prison for adolescent mistakes like Terrence's. So those are some questions of implementation that really demand attention from the legal community. Um, similarly, the Miller court, Evan Miller's case, even though the court said that it wasn't outright banning juvenile life without parole, it did say, as I mentioned, that that appropriate circumstances for that sentence should be exceedingly rare. And that is not proving to be the case. So Michigan, for example, Michigan is one of the states that houses um, a high population of juvenile lifers. And in that jurisdiction, 
because those 300 some odd individuals in that state are entitled to a new sentencing hearing, the prosecutor has to decide what he or she's going to ask for, right? Well, again, because the court said that, that JL WAP should be an exceedingly rare uh, sentence, one would think that it wouldn't be all or even that many of those 300 cases, but the prosecutors in Michigan um, are seeking juvenile life without parole all over again for more than half of the inmates in the state. So um, we're not seeing robust implementation of these cases. And then I should man mention that one of the things that really shocked me in my, in my research was just to un understand the scale and the scope of this problem. So the implementation of Graham and Miller that I've talked about, for example, does not even begin to touch cases that aren't within those holdings. So in other words, I'll give you a couple examples. I get letters from inmates across the country all the time who say, here's my situation. Um, I entered into a plea agreement at 16. Part of the plea agreement was waiving my right to an appeal, and I agreed to a 65-year term sentence. Can I get some relief under these? Because if I serve 65 years, I'm definitely going to die in prison. And it seems like what the court was getting at is that I shouldn't die in prison for something I did at 16 without ever getting a second look. And I agree with that person who's writing me that letter, but his case does not fall within the Graham and Miller decisions. It may someday, there may be a court that says, well, the spirit of what the Supreme Court meant in those cases suggests that individual should get a second look. But as a matter of, of um, rigid interpretation, it doesn't. And, and that's really heartbreaking, right? Because as I said, in my opinion, those are cases where we sentenced a child to die in prison. And under the Supreme Court's directives, those individuals are entitled to a review of those sentences, and they're not always getting them. So ending the war on kids, or in the book what I refer to as a war for kids, um, re requires vigilance from the legal community, certainly, in terms of really pushing hard for the implementation of these cases. And then, of course, there's this whole other space of where I'd like to see the case law go. <laughs> um, I think that those cases tell us that kids belong in juvenile court and that mandatory transfer laws should also be unconstitutional under those decisions. Uh, and there is some movement to argue for that. Um, I've heard from lawyers saying, hey, you wrote a law review article about that. Can we translate that into a, a legal challenge? So hopefully that's on the horizon. Um, similarly, I've argued before in law reviews, and I make the case for it again in the book, that I think mandatory minimums are problematic enough for adults, but they have no place when sentencing children. They're just completely inappropriate in my mind, and I think they're also um, unconstitutional after these recent Supreme Court decisions. So um, those are two things I think we need to do in terms of pursuing a war for kids, is just keep at it on the criminal justice reform front, keep at it as lawyers in the legal community trying to really make sure these cases have meaning as they trickle down to the states. And the last thing I'll talk about tonight before um, before I want to hear what you guys have to say, uh, is, is and I do address this at length in the book, is this idea of arguing against incarceration for youth, just across the board, arguing against incarceration and for rehabilitation. And so, you know, one of the things that's really sobering is that um, youth incarceration rates are down today than they were at their peak in the mid-1990s, but we still have too many kids in the system. We have, on average, about a million arrests per year. About a quarter of those cases go through the adult court system. On any given day, there are about 50,000 kids sitting in juvenile detention, and there are another 10,000 kids sitting in an adult correctional facility, mostly a jail, right, where they're w awaiting their hearings. Um, and that's just crazy. That's a huge amount of kids. And we don't reserve it for serious offenses. Sometimes people hear that and think, well, that must be a lot of law-breaking kids. Yes, there are, there are kids who commit serious crimes. But only about 25% of kids in juvenile detention are being held on the basis of serious offenses. And by serious, I mean things like aggravated assault, sexual assault, homicide, and armed robbery. Those are serious offenses. But only about a quarter of the kids in detention are even charged with those. 
which means we've got a ton of kids in the system. The Atlantic just did a great article on this. Um, we have a ton of kids in the system who are there because they're doing age-appropriate things, right? They're acting out in the hallways in high school, or they've broken a curfew, or um, they were drinking alcohol in public. Right? Technically, those are crimes. They're status offenses because of the, of the status of being a juvenile. You, you obviously can't be drinking. You can't be out past curfew. But the problem, in addition to just the soul-crushing aspect of incarceration, the problem is that we know youth incarceration has what's called a criminogenic effect, which is just a very fancy way of saying that it makes someone a better criminal. Right? If you put a child who has a history of trauma, and most kids in the system have a history of trauma, two-thirds have a mental health diagnosis, if you put that child in a correctional facility, it's easy to see why they're going to become better criminals, if you will, right? Youth incarceration is a survival experience, whether it's in youth detention or in an adult prison. It is truly a survival experience. And so, um, as I share in the book, most young people in prison who write to me universally wake up each day hoping to survive that day. Hoping to survive it, meaning fending off physical and sexual assault. And the choice, if you're trying to fend off assault, is either to succumb to that, right, which is obviously traumatic, or to be aggressive. And I talk about this in the book as a double bind, because um, in prison, there are so many rules, and individuals can get tickets, disciplinary write-ups, whatever the, the facility calls them, um, for any number of things. Uh, not just for fighting or fending off a fight, but for things like, you know, walking too close to a fence or um, not keeping your, your cell neat enough or being late for a visitor, right? You're walking a gauntlet all the time. And, and the skills that a person needs to acquire in order to survive that incarceration experience are exactly the opposite of what they need to be productive members of society. Right? And at the same time, we know that 80% of youth who are charged as adults will be back in society before their 21st birthday. Right? So even if readers, listeners, citizens, even if people don't empathize with the plight of kids who enter the system, and I do, I think the system is rigged. And that, if it, and that it's rigged along class and, and racial lines. But even if you don't empathize with that, we all have a collective interest. Just because we know these kids are coming back into society, we have a collective interest in ensuring that we keep kids out of facilities to the extent that we can, and that when they really need to be there, that we, we ensure that that form of detention improves that child rather than further damaging them. So I will end there. Thank you so much for your attention and your listening and your presence. And, um, I look forward to your comments. Yes, uh, first of all, great lecture. Thanks. Uh, you, you mentioned that many of the prosecutors who are moving children into the adult system have some options as to whether they're doing that. What is the pressure to move them into the adult system, and do they feel like the results are appropriate? I mean, are there people saying, yeah, we think life without parole is appropriate for this guy? Yeah, great question. So, um, so there are sort of three ways. Sometimes prosecutors have discretion. There are three ways a child can end up in adult court. So uh, three different transfer mechanisms. The first is that old-fashioned way, which, where the prosecutor has to go to the judge and say, here's a kid who I think belongs in adult court. And that's to your question of, of like, do they really think that's a good thing? Um, and I'll come back to that. The second is um, what's called um, direct file, where the, the law says nothing about whether the kid needs to be in juvie or adult court, and the prosecutor can just do that without discussing it with the judge. Um, that's the most problematic. And the other are what are called statutory exclusion laws, laws that say if you're above a certain age or charged with a certain offense, it's just the nature of the offense, then the prosecutor has, doesn't have to make a choice. It's just that case is going to be dealt with in adult court. But when we're talking about things that involve the discretion of the prosecutor, um, at the risk of sounding like a, um, a deeply cynical person who's anti-prosecutor, and I'm not, right? I tell my students all the time, I encourage them to be prosecutors because we need good prosecutors. 
think that one of the dangers is that um, prosecutors are judged by success, and success involves things like conviction rates and length of sentence. And add to that the fact that in jurisdi some jurisdictions they elect their prosecutors. And you know, you look at the 39 jurisdictions that elect their judges, and those judges are campaigning on the severity of sentences. Right, that they've been able to hand down. So I do think that there's a culture on the on the prosecution side that can lead to this sense of um, the, the the more people I can convict and the stiffer the sentences I can get, the the better I'm doing. And that's a that's just a cultural danger in prosecutions offices. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, I was thinking of the case that in Washington implemented Graham, a case, um, State v. Odell, in which a young man received a term of years, asserted youth as a mitigating factor. The trial court found that it couldn't consider that. Um, that was reversed, and when it came back down on resentencing, the juvenile made the same argument. The trial court recited the new rule and then gave him the exact same sentence. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question is, in, in how do we get to the point where this requirement for mitigating consideration um, goes beyond the appellate opinions and actually changes the way that we're sentencing in practice? Yeah, so great question. So I think a couple things. First, the Supreme Court, um, the United States Supreme Court, just recently, I think last year, uh, reversed an Arizona decision that had done very, something very similar. Um, where the Arizona courts basically said, hey, we, we reconsidered it, we, we, we registered the fact, we noted for the record that this was a juvenile at the time of the offense, Beep, same sentence imposed. And so the Supreme Court kind of slapped their wrist and said, that, that doesn't count, that's not what we meant. Um, and so I think that's one encouraging sign. But, you know, look, they've been slapping this, the Fifth Circuit's hand for the last, you know, 40 years <laughs> and not making a lot of headway on that. So I think the, the more important answer lies in legislative responses. And hopefully state legislatures, um, we've seen this in um, West Virginia, for example, where they've implemented a statute that says, look, this is what you need to do with a kid, right? Or in, in Massachusetts where they're doing parole reviews, they now have variables that those parole boards have to consider when they're dealing with JLWAP cases. So I think in the long run, it's going to be the legislature kind of adding some texture to what the Supreme Court intended. Great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you again. Um, yeah, you've talked the about the pressure that prosecutors face to get convictions and elected judges face yeah. to be tough on crime. Um, has the American Bar Association taken any position on this? And uh, what has been the role of law schools in mm -hmm. creating um, perhaps an environment that encourages uh, this level of prosecution against juveniles? Yeah, so, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know the answer to your first question, which is, has the ABA taken a position, um, you, I presume you mean on the issue of um, yes. s the sentences that prosecutors mm -hmm. are seeking and their position. I, I'm not sure, um, and that's obviously a, something they'd have to do very carefully, <laughs> because a, a good chunk of their membership is um, in, the, uh, in the prosecution bar. Um, but to your question about law schools, um, you know, I think, I think it comes in waves. Um, we're certainly in a phase in legal education where, again, because of the American Bar Association, there's a push toward um, focusing on a, a, a renewed focus on things like um, representing the indigent on a pro bono basis and that sort of thing. But I don't know that law schools are making that worse. I, I'd like to think we're not. Um, but you know, I mean, I'd be lying if I if I didn't say that I think my colleagues, for example, who were prosecutors before they came to academia, they probably teach criminal procedure very differently than I do, right? And I would imagine that that affects people's sense of, of what's right and appropriate for prosecutors. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Hi, my name is Wesley Irwin. Really happy that you did this town hall. Oh, great, thanks. I'm glad um, to be here. I wanted to get your opinion on two different issues, okay. two, two things that came to mind during your talk. One is it seems to me that as long as we have a capitalist system in which people are making money off of others being in prison, that there's, as long as there's a financial incentive for people to be there, the mm -hmm. prison population is going to keep growing. So, um, you know, while we can look at the case studies and at the micro level and say, 
this person shouldn't be in jail for this reason, they have X, Y, Z factors, class race, et cetera. I'm more curious in terms of like the, the big picture, like what, yeah. you, what you think is, is actually going on in terms of intent, um, which then brings me, so that's the one issue is the private prisons and, yeah. and what you see is that. The second question um, is related, which is, um, I don't know if, if people here have seen the movie 13th, on the third, yeah, same director as Selma. Um, that movie really opened up a lot of people's eyes, definitely opened up my eyes. And one of the things that was quoted in there was Nixon's advisor saying that uh, the reason that they started the war on drugs was so they could go after the black rights, uh, um, civil rights movement, mm -hmm. uh, people on the left, progressives, and that, um, and that that then directly feeds into, again, not only are we locking people up and, and targeting activists in certain aspects, but mm -hmm. then making money off the fact that they're now in prison working for us. So can you comment on those two things, please? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I don't know that I can do so efficiently, but, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, so to the first point, so the, the private prison thing, I think, unfortunately, um, I wish it were just a question of we need to get rid of private prisons because that would be a much simpler fix. Private prisons actually comprise a very small percentage of correctional facilities that we have in this country. Um, there, there's no doubt that they're problematic uh, for the reasons that you articulated. I think the bigger concern that we, that we do need to be going after, just given the uh, proportion of prisons that are actually private, the, the issue that I think is driving the um, profit concerns you mentioned are um, unions representing correctional officers. So, you know, prisons are built not coincidentally in far away places so that we can pretend that people who commit a crime or some, or some criminals are elsewhere, <laughs> not human beings like the rest of us. Um, and so it's out of sight, out of mind. But oftentimes, you know, you go to visit, uh, well, at least I do in my, in my research, a prison, and y you gotta drive like four hours from a major metropolis to get there. And so that's the town's employment. Right, and, and we see that across the country that correctional officers are um, very resistant, the unions are very resistant to, to job loss, right, or to anything that would reduce the, the need for that. So that I think is a, a bigger issue and needs more direct confrontation in the political process than even the private prison issue. Um, to your second point, there is no doubt that, uh, that the war on crime, the war on drugs, the war on kids, it's been racially coded from the beginning. Um, if you look, you mentioned the Nixon era issue. Same was true, I would say, also with um, the war on drugs in the Reagan era. I mean, the war on drugs, you know, we started ramping up the war on drugs and, and rolling out federal money to beef up state level law enforcement long before the crack epidemic, right? It, it was not a, we had a crack epidemic and then we responded with, with beefed up law enforcement. It was actually, predated that. And, and so I think, and you know, you think about the, the rhetoric and the images of what the war on drugs entailed and the image that, that the administration was putting forth of like welfare queens and just, you know, th this idea, I mean, it was so racially coded, you, you almost can't believe that they got away with saying it. Um, so I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. And um, that's why I mentioned Michelle Alexander's work because, you know, her argument, her claim in her book, The New Jim Crow, is that the correctional system today is what Jim Crow laws once were, right? First we had slavery, and then we had Jim Crow laws, and now we have the correctional system. And that it's basically accomplishing the same end as both of those prior institutions, slavery and Jim Crow. Can I ask you a point yeah. of clarification? Just, just briefly, a point of clarification. You mentioned uh, Reagan and Nixon. Did incarceration rates go down under the Obama administration, or did they go up? Mm. And do you see any real difference between the two parties on this issue? I wish I could say there's a huge difference. Um, Clinton signed in 94 one of the worst federal laws in terms of uh, ramping up, you know, f cracking down uh, mandatory minimums, juvenile transfer laws. <laughs> so I wish I could say that. Obama certainly was better. I'm not sure if it was because he was a Democrat or if it was because he was in a moment where he could be, right? I mean, he was the first sitting president to visit a prison. He oversaw the clemency initiative that, that, um, that really um, ushered in the release of first-time nonviolent drug offenders who were serving these huge long sentences in federal prisons. But I'm not sure that we can say, oh, that's because he was blue and the others were red. I just, um, I, I wish it were that simple, but it hasn't been historically. And even Hillary Clinton, when she was on the campaign trail, had to deal with the fact that she had really been a part of that 94 crime bill.
Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, could you give us an example of uh, a sentencing scheme that's just and fair, that, that takes into consideration uh, individual circumstances, but at the same time avoids regional differences or ah, jurisdictional yeah. differences in sentencing for yeah. similar uh, cases? Sure. So I can certainly do the first part. I can't do the second part, and that's just a function of our country, right? So, so to your question of uh, when you said, can you give us an example of a just sentencing system? So I would say, first of all, it, it's one that is not predetermined, right? It's one that gives the sentencing body, whether that's a judge or a jury, the chance to do exactly what you just described, to look at the case and say, okay, you know, first of all, who is this person? How and why did they commit this offense against society? Um, what are we hoping to do for them, right? I mean, there are some people where we are, the rehabilitative ideal is not even part of the picture. And if you're sentencing someone to life without parole, as Justice Kennedy said, it forswears the rehabilitative ideal. Like, you're, you're just throwing that person away, you know? So I think it's this kind of robust, and as it sounds, time-consuming, expensive, um, resource-intensive, and so forth. Um, but to your second point about how do we avoid regional differences, well, that's just the plight of federalism, right? I mean, I would far rather, if I'm going to pass a bad check, it's not going to be in Texas or Florida, right? Because, um, I mean, not to be flippant about it, but, you know, the, if I do something, if anyone commits a crime in one state or another, there are going to be regional differences. But, but shouldn't, shouldn't there be nationally the same... Uh punishment for passing a bad check? Yeah, uh, no. In Florida no. or Washington? Okay. So no says our Constitution, right? I mean, that's just, as I said, that's, for better or worse, that's what federalism looks like, and the, and the, the response of the, the framers and the current court interpreting that would say, hey, if you don't like that, vote with your feet and leave Florida or leave Texas. You know, that, that, that's the beauty of federalism. Now, at the federal level, we certainly have federal crimes. Um, and in that sense, there's uniformity. Um, but the federal crimes and the federal correctional population comprise just a tiny percentage of those two million, right? By and large, um, criminalized state law. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks for taking the time away from your mothering to do this extensive work. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm relying on their grandfather right now to take care of them. <laughs> well, how fortunate that they have a grandfather that can do that. Yeah, no, Unlike he's awesome. some of um, the young men that you've been mm -hmm. talking to us about. That's why this book is dedicated to my boys, because as I say in the, in the acknowledgments, they are my motivation for ending the war on kids. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, bring... The, when you were talking about how um, there is sort of a widespread or there is an effort out about um, rethinking our sentencing, um, I'm not saying it quite correctly, but the example was that even the Koch brothers are yeah. getting together with the ACLU. I don't know if it was in... 13th or if it was in another, uh, there's a very interesting documentary out that's something like, we make money off of criminals, something yeah. like that. They talk about how it's not surprising that the Koch brothers are getting involved in this because, in fact, if you mandate, for instance, ho home arrest, well, they get to charge these companies that do the home arrest. Mm -hmm. They get to charge for daily use of whatever that uh, tag is that shows mm -hmm, where you mm -hmm. are. That is a money-making proposition. I don't think the Koch brothers really do believe in rehabilitation. Um, I think it's just about money. So that if you look, like Deep Throat says, follow the money. Mm -hmm. These mandated, these societally mandated, many of which are constitutionally or legislatively mandated, education, criminal justice, mm -hmm. I would throw bail and uh, detention facilities where you don't even have a constitution, mm 
and education. Mm -hmm. We so our military with black whatever it is, um, our education and criminal justice. This is all being privatized to a situ, and when we throw it into the private sector, there is no transparency. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree with you that it is a reform of the criminal justice system and all those other absolutely necessary forms that we as citizens, inhabitants, people of goodwill and thought must be looking at because I think it's our democracy. It's not. The, it is is at stake. No question. Your 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 son's future. My son's future is at stake. I appreciate the work you've done, but I encourage us all to when suddenly to give consideration about how suddenly the Koch brothers want to get on board. I think we have to look a little bit deeper because what my brain says is, does this make sense? Right, I will say this, I, I mentioned them just as an example of sort of unlikely allies in this process. I am hugely encouraged by, and this is democracy in action, what's driving this is the electorate. So California is a great example. Um, California has a world-class educational system, or at least it once did, right? Um, I went to law school in California. Um, their state school system is very impressive. Well, they reached a point where they were spending more on corrections than higher education, right? That's true in 18 states, but California is a huge state, right? So for them to be spending more on corrections than higher education is a big deal. And when, they're, when their citizenry realized that, they said, you know what? We're fed up. And so they abolished the nation's most severe three strikes provision. Right? California had the most severe three strikes law on the books that said if you commit you know, three felonies that by the third strike you're serving automatic life without parole. The voters overturned that three strikes provision and only narrowly upheld the death penalty um, by referendum. So I think it is a grassroots thing that's driving this change. Um, and a lot of it is coming from fiscal concerns, but, but the opposite fiscal concerns that you're articulating, right? Fiscal concerns where the taxpayers are saying, that's not where I want my money going. I want my money going to schools, not prisons. So I'm, I'm maybe more optimistic than you are. I think that we can utilize that kind of uh, uh, value points as we try to convince others of the utility of, of uh, rethinking how we have come to this point. So I'm on board with that. I just think we have to ask ourselves, does this make sense when we have allegiances that have been so vitriolic in the past. So thanks again. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, I want to thank you for your advocacy and everything. Uh, my name is James, Hi, James. and uh, I am a formerly incarcerated person who served a 10-year mandatory minimum in federal prison. Okay. Um, I was just, I was really kind of got into thought when I, and I get, and I have this thought every time I hear this comment, and I just, you know, maybe you can uh, give me your, your thoughts on this, but when people say the system is broken, um, it seems to me that the system is working exactly the way <laughs> that it was designed. Yeah. If we understand the history of the uh, prison industrial complex, and so I just kind of wanted yeah. to, yeah, hear your thoughts on that because I think maybe it's broken for us, the people, yeah. but for the people that are benefiting off incarceration, you know, new slavery and all yeah. that stuff. So. so I agree with what you're saying, um, that there are vested interests that, that stand to benefit from this industrial complex, and as long as it's in existence, they will stand to benefit. Um, that's why I said I think th I'm not... I'm not as troubled by the private prisons as I am by the unions and the employees of correctional facilities, only because the private prisons are a smaller in number. Um, when I say it's broken, I guess I'm bringing to it the perspective of a lawyer and an advocate. So when I say it's broken, I mean it's broken in the sense that uh, 
we should not have two systems in this country, and we do, right? So Brian Stevenson is a Supreme Court advocate, argues for kids all the time. He says all the time when he talks that you are better off in this country being guilty and wealthy than poor and innocent, and he's right. And that is scary, and it's wrong, and it's unconstitutional, and it should be an embarrassment to this country. Um, so that's what I mean when I say it's broken, that you know, we've said since 1963 that if you're a poor person accused of a crime, you have the right to an attorney because the state can't just hail you into court and throw you away without representation. We say that, but 55 years later, that right has never been realized on the ground. That's how it's broken, sure. right? Or the fact that 94% of cases in this country are resolved through a plea bargaining process where the prosecutor basically exacts everything they can from that person. Why? Because they can, <laughs> right? That's how it's broken. So I agree with what you said. I'm, I'm just coming at it from a constitutional perspective. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, uh, there, there was something that you said too. Um, so in Washington State, we had uh, this year in the, in the session, Senate Bill 5069, post-secondary education for inmates okay. passed. And we had been working on that for like three years to get that through. And what we had to do right, is really talk to them in the language that they, the Republicans and the language that they, the conservatives, the language they understand. Mm -hmm. We had to talk about tax money. Yep. We had to talk about public safety. We had to really, you know, bring it. And then we had to write the bill as a Senate bill yes. to finally get it passed. So, um, And that's okay, know. right? I mean, right. I, my thought on that is, and, and that's why, you know, I, when I mentioned the, um, the unlikely ally alliances that we've seen emerge, Whatever, in my opinion, whatever brings people to the table to have this conversation um, is valuable. It does trouble me a little bit that the impetus for much of this reform was the recession in 08, right? Because when times are good again, when we're flush with cash, are we okay with the industrial complex? Like, that troubles me a little bit, and that's why I always begin with the moral case for reform, because I think that has to be, at the end of the day, the primary reason we're at the table. But what you're talking about is, Real politic, right? I mean, that's just realism. Well, and then you're right, grassroots, you know, yeah. that's where it's gotta start. Is. Thanks for your work. Yeah, thank you. I think this will be our last question. Okay. Oh, God. Hi, my name's Dominique Davis. Um, and I Dominique. agree with this brother, the system is running exactly the way it is. Um, I wanted to ask you um, and, and get your opinion um, on, do you, uh, I always hear these conversations. I'm, I'm part of these conversations constantly. I have my own organization called Community Passageways. I'll tell you about that in a second. But community. Community Passageways. Okay, Passageways. Right? Okay. And so, uh, so far this year, we've been able to get 18 felonies dropped out of the system okay. on young adults. Right? We, but that's because it's been a community effort. Okay. And, and so we've been able to take our young people and um, get them on their feet, get them in school, get them jobs, get them internship, blah, 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 get them going, mentorship, lead, get them housing, whatever, and then write this letter and this narrative, bringing them to county and city meetings and having them on steering committees and panels and blah, blah, blah. And so we've been able to get uh, reference letters from government entities okay. to vouch for this kid's character or this young adult's character. And we've been able to put it in front of prosecutors and been able to get charged. Anyway, I'll, I'll get off of that. Where That's I'm at okay. is we're <laughs> tired of having this conversation. Yeah. Right? Because we keep talking about the system, the system, the system. Yeah. And the system's running because we allow it to run, right? Have you, through your research, found any other instances where community is stepping up and making the system make adjustments because we are the community and we should be using our voice and our numbers and our power to step into the system and break what we're sitting here complaining about. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, the law, I don't disagree with you. I don't um, disagree with your impatience and your fatigue over these conversations. I share your sense of fatigue, <laughs> right? I really do. Um, I, you know, I think democracy is a slow moving beast. <laughs> and that's why I said I take great comfort in things like what happened in Virginia yesterday because yesterday in Virginia, people stood up and said, actually, I'm gonna call you out as a liar when, you're, when you, Mr. President, are tweeting about MS-13 as this radical threat to Virginia's public safety. No, people stood up and said, actually, we have one of the lowest crime rates in the country. So we're not gonna buy this fear mongering. We're gonna actually elect people who are smart on crime, who are pursuing criminal justice reform. Um, so I, I take comfort in that. And, and I know it's not, I agree with you, it's not happening fast enough. The relief is not coming fast enough. And believe me, when I deal with inmates who are 
who are being told we're going to pass you over for another another parole hearing in two more years, just continue to work at your rehabilitative efforts, and they've been infraction free for 30 years. It's not moving fast enough for them either. But I'm, but I'm, you know. I'm Is there a rally cry that you think you can create with your platform to get community to come together and have a voice to come up against the district attorney's office? Our district attorney's office here in King County has been very open. Yeah, to get I mean, I'm hoping, from. you know, one of the reasons I wrote this book is that just as a mom, you know, writing law review articles, nobody, let's face it, nobody's talking about or reading law review articles, <laughs> right? But one of the reasons I wrote this book is that I'm at the playground, I'm at schools, and people are saying to me, really? That's what you're writing about? We do that? So I think part of what we need to do is just increase people's awareness. You're fatigued. Most people are ignorant. I mean, that's just the truth, right? Most people are just unaware. All right. Thank you, Cara. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it.